It's on Google. It is. Yeah. Okay, welcome everybody to the Uxbridge Senior Center. Can I have your attention, please? Thank you. Thank you so much. We're very pleased to have Brenda Fitzgerald here today from Uxbridge Orthopedics. And she's going to be talking to us about a very important uh, uh, health issue called uh, the difference between vertigo and dizziness. So sometimes that can hit us at times unexpected, and it, it can really knock us for a loop. So thank you for coming out to talk to us about this and give us information about this, Brenda. No problem. Try not to trip you. All right, they're making me use this. <laughs> Don't really want to. So how many of you people think you've had vertigo before? Anybody? Yep. Okay, any guys? No guys? You're all perfect. Okay, got it. Um, and, and for those of you who said yes, what do you think made it happen? What made it feel worse? Did you, did you figure that out? If fluid in your, what, what made the vertigo happen to you? Do you know? Or d was there certain positions that made it worse, made the room spin? Things like that. If you're lying down, then you, then you, then you, then you go to get up. Down. Right, right. Even sometimes you're lying down by switching. It can, changing positions. Right, so th that question is probably the biggest question your doctor should ask if you come to them with some dizziness or vertigo. Uh, because there's a difference between dizziness and vertigo and it's a it's a question I get on a regular basis I'm what they call a certified vestibular therapist I treat vertigo there's actually a treatment for it. it's very quick and easy to do uh, you don't need medications usually one or two visits in physical therapy is enough it's very quick and easy if it's truly vertigo uh, but that's not the same as dizziness so I I think my goal today is so that you understand the difference between the two and, and know when you should react and which way you should react and who should see you for your symptoms. All right? So, what is the difference between vertigo and dizziness? So that's the main key. The room is spinning. I got that. Uh, vertigo can be confused with a lot of different things. It can be confused with what I call an ataxic gait or, or walking funny. You know, you're walking a crooked line, the police would pull you over. That, that lady's uh, retiring son, Peter, would pull you over. Uh, disturbance of vision, nausea, Sometimes it can be a lack of confidence. You're nervous about walking on an unlevel surface, so you're, you're like, Ugh. Um, It can be an inner ear thing, but it can also be blood pressure related, and it can be related to your heart, and it's functioning appropriately. So vertigo is really the sense of the environment moving when it's not. So the room actually feels like it's spinning. Uh, but you know, intellectually, it probably is not. Uh, can be aggravated, usually is aggravated by certain positions. Uh, like when I lie on my right side, the room is spinning, but when I roll over to my left, I'm fine. That's a pretty classic vertigo. Um, or only when I turn to the right does it, does it make me feel like the room is spinning. Um, more importantly, what I look at when I'm evaluating someone with true vertigo is what's really happening is not actually the room spinning, of course, but their eyes start shaking. And I'm looking at that to see which direction their eyes are shaking. And they're shaking really fast. It's very, very quick. And it might go sideways or it might go up and down, but that tells me what I need to do for treatment. So oftentimes in physical therapy or if you see uh, a, an ear, nose, and throat doctor, they may, what I call, throw you around a little bit and get you into some of those positions to see, to get you to the point where you're like, oh, here it goes, the room's spinning, which is not a particularly fun evaluation to go through, but then we can look and say, okay, you think the room is spinning, let me see what your eyes are doing and in which direction they're shaking, and then they can figure out what they need to do for treatment accordingly. Um, disequilibrium or lack of balance, unsteadiness, those can be confused with this, um, but the key difference from, from your viewpoint is that the room won't be spinning. It just, you might feel lightheaded or funny or the floor doesn't feel like it's a stable surface, but the room's generally not span, uh, spinning. 
Usually that's c combined with standing and walking, which is very difficult usually. Uh, you might be lightheaded, the feeling like you're swimming or floating or swaying in your head. Um, you may even have blurred vision or other symptoms. And that's kind of the key difference. So when you see a specialist, they're going to start asking, well, does this happen? Does this happen? And they're trying to split you up and figure out, is this vertigo or is this something else? Because there's a long list of something else that it can be. So to tell a difference, the good medical exam will ask you what started it. Maybe it was a cold, maybe you flew on a plane, things like that. that would be, those would be typical reasons for vertigo. Um, they, you may say, I don't know, I just woke up and I sat up and I got dizzy. That's a really common one. That may not be vertigo. Could be, could, could not be, but uh, more questions need to follow to, to clarify. Um, we want to know if you're having ringing in your ears, blurred vision, numbness, difficulty swallowing, uh, amnesia, forgetting things. Um, and, and then we will look for that that eye wiggling or nystagmus as we call it. Um, so the cause, many causes of regular old dizziness, not vertigo, can be low salt, uh, low potassium, uh, heart problems. Your heart's not functioning right. It's not bringing oxygen through your body and you're going to feel low energy and very lightheaded and dizzy. Um, low blood pressure will do it. That's the most common one. That one shows up mostly in the morning. If you say you've been sleeping all night and then you get up out of bed and you feel really dizzy and maybe you say the room is spinning, that's often because during the night when you're laying down, your blood everything slows down in your body, including your blood pressure. So your blood pressure goes way down, you go to sit up and, whoa, I have to work now, and it starts to think. And that's more often the dizziness and blood pressure effect. So the key on that one is to get up slowly and see if that makes a difference. Things neurological can go on that can make dizziness. Th uh, patients with MS, multiple sclerosis, or somebody who's, who has a stroke can have dizziness. That can be their main symptom uh, early on. Um, medications, a medication change can make you dizzy often. Uh, so they might, a good physician will be asking you, did you change this medication or a new dose or are you taking your normal heart medications but yesterday you were a little sore so you added some aspirin into the mix? That can play with things. Um, low blood sugar, for those of you who are diabetics in the room, you know when your sugar runs low you feel off. Uh, and can be very dizzy, right down to fainting. Um, anemia, which is a low iron count in your blood, and also regular old migraines can make you dizzy as well. So those are all questions that the doctor's gonna ask to try to rule out some of those things, because the treatments are gonna vary. If your blood pressure is low, we might need to play with the medications. We're gonna check that blood pressure, et cetera. Vertigo is different. It is a, more of a motion sickness, but it can ca be caused by a few different things. Uh, there are a lot of big medical terms around there. My favorite is what the most common for true vertigo. We call it BPPV, which really stands for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. It's a big mouthful. Uh, lucky you guys didn't have to learn how to spell it. I did. Um, and that's the inner ear thing that you hear about the most, and I'll get into that in a moment. But you can also have things that affect your inner ear, like a nerve, um, a, a nerve infection, the vestibular nerve, it's a nerve in the brain, but if you have some pressure or swelling in the brain for one reason or another, it can affect the nerve that goes to the ear, therefore giving you the vertigo, but it's really coming from the nerve. It's not coming from the BPPV which I'll describe in a minute. There's a disease called Meniere's disease. It's typically a low salt issue. They'll have you, um, it's a chronic vertigo. They have it forever. It's hard to get rid of. They usually will tell you to rest, but almost always that comes with a hearing loss as well. Um, and then a deformation in one of the, ar uh, the arteries in the ear can also reduce the circulation into the ear and therefore create that room spinning. So those are all things that affect the inner ear, but not necessarily that BPPV. Now, BPPV is unique into itself because what it really is, 
is you have crystals or, or let's say flaky dry skin everywhere. I mean, we have it, we shed skin all the time, that's very normal, but there's some inside the ear as well. And what happens is every once in a while it flakes off and it goes into the canals of the ear. And there are three canals in the ear and depending upon which one this crystal goes into, it will make that eye move sideways or it will make that eye move up and down when I'm examining it. So, what ha so the, the crystal, the presence of the crystal is okay. Normally, that just flakes off, it goes in your lymph system and let's just say your toilet meets it at another end. But in this abnormal case, it flakes into the ear canal. In the ear canal, you have little pieces of hair that detect movement. And so this crystal comes in and it rolls around in there. The hairs go, oh, we're moving? It sends a signal to your brain, and then your brain says, hey, the, just so you know, the room is spinning right now. Uh, so it's kind of a false positive. So the, f the evaluation, once we've ruled out some of the blood pressure and eye issues and things like that, will be to literally get you in some of those positions that make you dizzy and watch those eyes. Because the eyes will tell me which canal it's in and then therefore what I need to do for treatment. All right, does that make sense, sort of? Yeah. Okay, um, so I, sometimes I present like this and I have slides so you can see it. I, I, uh, it's harder in this room to do that, so I didn't bring them today. But um, there is, I, I always call it, I, I have to throw you around now. It truly is, it's a fast movement. I have a person sitting on the table and I quickly whip them back and with their head hanging over the, over the end of the table. Immediately, a true BPPV or a true vertigo patient will go, oh God, this is horrible, My, the room's definitely spinning. And their reaction is almost always to close their eyes. But that's not good for me, right? Because I need to see those eyeballs wiggling around to know what I need to do for treatment. The good news is, as miserable as that is for the patient, often, as I'm doing it, the crystal starts moving in the direction I want. So often, once I see the eyes moving, I just finish it and I bias that crystal. I know which canal it's in and then I can turn you on the side, wait, you'll wiggle a little more, wait a moment, the crystal's starting to come down where it needs to exit and then I have you sit back up and now the crystal's dumped out where it should be. So, so oftentimes during the eval, as I'm doing that miserable test where I throw you back and make sure <laughs> you really are dizzy, um, I'm watching those eyes and then I can continue on with the treatment. And it's a very rapid treatment. Uh, as I said, sometimes people have some lingering effects for a day or so. They feel like, oh, I feel very nauseous after you threw me around. But usually within a day or two, they're substantially better. They'll notice, oh, I can lie on my right side now. So sometimes I'll have a person follow up with me a few days later just to make sure it's gone. I might throw them around again to make sure it's gone. And then often I teach them how to do that move themselves. So if it comes back, they can handle it. They don't need me, they can handle it themselves if they so choose. Um, so that's the difference. I'm literally trying to take that crystal and roll it right out of that canal, depending upon which canal it's in. Um, does that make sense? Any questions on that? It's not fun the day of the evaluation. If you truly have BPPV, I'm going to make you dizzy, which is not a fun thing to do. Uh, but it is, it, it is something that fixes quickly. The most common frustrating patient for me is the one who goes to their primary care, has BPPV, but their primary care may not recognize that. And the doctor says, oh, you're dizzy? All right, here's some medication to see. What they typically give you is a medication called meclizine. It's the same thing they give you when you're going on a boat, that little patch often. Uh, and that helps with dizziness. But remember, if your cause is that crystal, it's still sitting there. That medicine is doing nothing to help, help relieve the symptoms. That crystal needs to get out of there. There are a few people who are lucky enough to not know it, but can position themselves right and all of a sudden it's gone the next day as quickly as it came. Uh, th that's an, often an accident. They happen to roll from one side to the other exactly as I would have them. If they have their neck position right, it's lucky, but it can happen, then that probably was BPPV. 
Um, the other thing I want to say is just because you get it doesn't mean you'll get it again. Doesn't, it, there's no relationship to, oh, now I get vertigo. It, it, if we can get it away, if that crystal's out of the canal, there's no assumption on the medical part that you would get it again or e ever again. Uh, but like I said, the most common uh, patient we get is usually post sinus infection or traveling in an airplane where that altitude pressure uh, really gets to the eardrum that causes the flaking off of that crystal uh, so that those are the more common ways to get BPPV all right so now the people with the other diseases of the inner ear the nerve thing the Meniere's disease things like that they've had a balance problem for a long time and what we try to do is work on the balance. I can't change the inflammation of the nerve. The doctor may give you an anti-inflammatory if you have that. Um, that takes a brain scan to make sure you do have that. Um, but um, what I can do is this is somebody who's had a prolonged history of bad balance. And that puts you at risk for falls. Not a good thing to do as you get older. Uh, I th I, it was a several years back, they did a major research. The leading cause of death in geriatrics is a hip fracture. It's not that the hip fracture causes you to die. It's that the hip fracture puts you in bed for a long time. And then your heart and et cetera start not working as well because you're in bed, you're not as mobile. Uh, balance problems can do the same thing. Uh, so oftentimes for those kind of people, and sometimes for the BPPV people, if they've had it a long time before they get to me, I will work on trying to restore their balance with some exercises. All right, so before I go, I, I wanted to give you some basic examples of exercises. They're ones you can do right there, either sitting at your chair or uh, standing up at your chair. If you want to join me, you're welcome to. Uh, but I want to give you an idea of what those balance exercises are. Um, what Marsha doesn't know about me is that in addition to being a physical therapist, I'm a competitive ballroom dancer, you know, like in Dancing with the Stars kind of stuff. So I do these exercises because balance is a very important part of my ability to do what Fred Astaire does backwards and on heels, right? Because that's what we girls do. So I'm doing lots of spinning and things like that. So I do a lot of these balance kind of exercises just so that I don't lose my ability to compete in, in ballroom dancing. Um, so, so some of these I do very readily while I'm brushing my teeth. There's nothing else going on. I've got a countertop right there. Very easy to fit into your day. You don't need to feel like you have to go do your exercises. I'm, I'm not a fan of that kind of thing. I feel like exercises should just kind of fit naturally in your day. It shouldn't feel like a timeout or a punishment that you have to go do your exercises. Uh, so, so these exercises are examples of ones that help with balance but are easy to fit in to, to your day. Um, the, main, the main piece of balance comes from your foot knowing where the ground is. That's malfunctioning in, for example, a diabetic who has neuropathy in their feet. They can't feel the ground. They're a little more numb in the feet. So those people might need some of the balance exercises. It comes from the inner ear, which is why we're talking about it today, balance does. It also comes from vision. So vision really helps you balance. It's why if I give you an exercise for balance, everybody's like, I gotta stare at something. Because you want that, those eyeballs to help you maintain where the horizon is and keep your balance. If I wanna make the exercise harder, I may make you close your eyes. That means the eyes can't contribute, so now the foot has to do more. And your muscles have to do more. And the, the last thing that's a piece of this is core strength hugely important in balance. So first, while you're sitting there in the chair, I want to give you an example of a really easy core strength kind of exercise to do. And all you need to do if you want to join me is get your buns all the way back in that chair that you're sitting in as best you can. And what I want you to notice, for those who are tall enough to get your buns all the way back in that chair, <laughs> I have, my mother's under five feet, so I understand. Um, is I want you to notice how much that arch in your low back is actually touching that, the back of the chair. 
And then I want you to pretend like your hand's back there, and I want you to try to push it further. Squish your hand if your hand's back there. Tense up the stomach muscles and kind of get that low back area to touch the chair really good. So that's an example of one way to add core. That's your stomach. No one's going to even know you're doing it. They can't even see it. It's a really small movement. What I tend to do is say, OK, now that I've got it touching the back of the chair and my abs are working, now try to move and challenge that, challenge that like march or kick out your leg. That's going to change that pressure again. You're going to say, no, uh I want to keep the same amount of pressure. How can I do that? What muscles do I need to find in order to get that to happen? So that's an easy, easy example. I use that basic principle with every exercise I give my patients, whether they're here for a knee, ankle, shoulder problem. I, I sit there and say, OK, good posture, get the abs in, get that, if, for those who know what the exercise is, a pelvic tilt. So get the pelvic tilt going. That's what you guys just did in the chair just now. And then hold it. Freeze. Don't let it move. Don't let it arch more. Don't let it hunch more either. And that is what. Uh, the basic principle of doing core work. So you can add it into cooking, um, really almost anything. If you're leaning over to the oven to get something out of the oven, a lot of people have back pain doing that. First, before you do it, tighten your abs, get that pretend you're in the chair, flatten that arch in your low back, and then reach in. You probably won't have back pain. Um, so that's one example of a core exercise. And then the balance exercise, for those who are good, I don't want anybody getting sued here. Uh, if you want to stand for a second, I'll show you some ideas of some balance exercise. If, if your balance is really on a lower level, some of these things can be done in a chair, but that's not a great challenge. And I'm not getting the feet part of the balance, and I need to do that. What I often do will, is get somebody in a corner. How many of these guys were in a corner in elementary school, you think, with the hat on and the pointy hat? You think all of them? <laughs> so, so you remember your time in the corner in elementary school, right? You do, right? Tell me the truth. <laughs> you, I believe you were good. You've been peaceful all time. This one, this one's trouble over there. Um, so what I do is I f tell patients to find a corner of their house, ideally with no furniture. That could be a wall and the refrigerator. I don't really care. But you want to tuck yourself into that corner. So I want you to imagine that I'm all tucked into the corner. That's a safe place to do some of these balance exercises. Then what I'm going to do is start to figure out how hard I need to make it for you. So often I'll say, OK, I want maybe one foot in front of the other, like you're walking on a balance beam. But you're not going to be walking. You're in a corner, so you've got a wall on either side. So if you get a little loopy, you've got the wall right there. But I'm not leaning on the wall anymore because I've, I've just taken a small baby step forward. It's close, it's safe, but I'm trying it. So this might be one example. If I do it with my right foot facing forward, as I am right now for you, um, I'm definitely going to need to do it with my left foot forward as well. And you will find that there's a difference. You're going to have one leg that, oh, I do better with my left foot forward. That's fine. Uh, that's very normal. And then if I want to make this harder, I'm going to say, as I said earlier, close your eyes. It immediately, you'll see it in me. I'll start to wobble a little bit more. The wobbling's normal. That's my body going, whoop, whoop, wait a minute, let me fix that. And that's all very normal. So I do those kind of things in the corner. I could go with standing on one foot which is what I do. I brush my teeth. That's how I fit it into my day. I've got a countertop there. I'm safe. And I literally will brush my teeth, they say, for two minutes. So I literally sit there, and for a minute per leg, I even lean over and spit out or whatever, and then I switch legs, do the other one. Now I've done my balance exercises for the day. At night, I'm going to brush my teeth again. It's just my thing I do. So that's very easy. Fits in naturally to your day and very simple to do. You can do a lower level activity instead of standing like your feet are on, on a balance beam. Just bring your feet together like they're touching and just try to stand. If that's easy, then I need to go further. I need to make it hard. If that's hard, we're there. We're good. You're wobbly a little bit. Fine. Let's just stay there. That's your level. Questions so far? Does that make sense? Yeah? 
So hopefully you've taken home a couple of things. You've got a couple of balance exercises, real easy to throw into your day, but you also have a rough idea of the difference between vertigo and plain old dizziness. But like I said, the key is that you, you don't go in and go, I have vertigo. Here's how I know. Brenda told me it's because the room is spinning. Because the doctor's going to say, well, wait a minute. Let me check your blood pressure. Let me check your eyes. Let me check some of those other things and make sure. Because again, some of these symptoms, it's kind of like saying you have a runny nose. That could be for a hundred reasons. We, our job is to figure out which one. Um, the key with vertigo, don't let it sit there. If it's truly in a position that you get dizzy, you need to go to the doctor. It's so much easier to fix if you, we fix it soon. If it's there for months, it's much harder to fix, like all things. The older it is, the harder it is to fix. <laughs> yes? Does it depend on your age whether they treat it or not? No, verti regular old BPP vertigo, which is about 80% of the dizziness. No, it doesn't matter at all. What I might do is do it differently in terms of the throwing you around part, which is part of my exam. Because I need that neck arched, but maybe you have an arthritic neck and you can't do that. Or maybe you're scared hanging over the end of the table like I want you to. So I'm going to modify how I do it so I can still get the neck arched as best I can, but maybe not over the end of the table because that's scarier. Um, so we'll do it differently. There are modified techniques to, to treat it, but no, they will not delay just because you're old. The all people, all, all people Yes, if it's truly vertigo, the key is getting the doctor to listen and giving him those symptoms like it's only when I lay on my right side but not on my left. Those are keys that your doctor should go, oh, okay, it's vertigo. It's not just the, the more common one like, that you mentioned is when I get up too fast in the morning. That, that's more probably blood pressure. They're going to go, oh, yeah, that's not a big deal. Get up slow. And they're going to ignore it. So, uh, well, not ignore it, but they're going to they're not going to panic about that one as much as they might vertigo. So knowing your symptoms, reporting them appropriately, and hopefully having a doctor who really listens to that. Do they often just misdiagnose it, though, like a regular doctor? They can. I, I would say the most common thing is that they just give you the medication, like, okay, yeah, here, have the medication, bye-bye. And the patient comes back two months later and says, I'm still dizzy. I'm still miserable. All right, well, and it's often the patients who generate, can I try physical therapy? I heard about vertigo. Can I do that? It's often how they get to, to us. The good primary care doctors will recognize it and treat it appropriately right away. Some of the good primary care doctors will know those same maneuvers, and they might try them. Um, they're not experts in all things, so they might not be an expert in this, but some are pretty good at it. it, it you know, it's, there's good ones in every profession, so, yep. So age has nothing to do with it. Age has nothing to do with straight out vertigo. Nope. Something and I had it for a while and then it just disappeared on its own. So yes, and it can disappear on its own, yep. Yep, because you just happened to roll from the right to the left and that was how the crystal needed to get out and you didn't know it, but it, yeah. you fixed it. Yep, yep. Question, anybody else questions? No questions back there? Is nausea, always nausea can be with either dizziness or ver vertigo, so that's a hard one. Oftentimes the person will get nauseous when I'm throwing them around, I must admit, for, for a BPPV person. It, it, you know, but the anxiety of me, I usually will try to show them, this is what we're going to do next. This is going to freak you out. I know that. I'm going to be here for you. And if you're nauseous, you're nauseous. It is what it is. But I, I try to hope that if I show them what's going to happen, then maybe it's less anxiety producing because the anxiety can make the nausea as well. Correct. So nausea is not necessarily a measure of, of which is which. Usually the biggie is what position. Is it a certain position? Every time I turn to my right, the room spins. And so it's not necessarily fluid in your inner ear. No, it's that crystal. There is fluid in your inner ear. It's supposed to be there. Uh, and the crystal kind of floats on top of those little hairs yeah. all the time. It, well, the crystal shouldn't, but those hairs are floating with that fluid. So, yep. OK. If Yes. <laughs> no, it's not old age, though. I hate that. I hate that. It's not just old age. And sometimes do they misdiagnose 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, absolutely. Um, if they know to do the test, there's no way to misdiagnose this. You can see the eyeballs going. I, I just had a patient the other day, came in for vertigo treatment. I did the test, nothing. The eyeballs were just, she's just looking at me, no wiggling at all. And it's very obvious wiggling. It's like really shaky. There's no doubt about it. And I was like, I don't think you have vertigo. So I stopped, I retested the other side, nothing. And she was saying, oh, here goes the room. And I'm looking at her eyes, there's nothing going on. I'm like, well, it's not a crystal in your ear, so there's not much I can do about it, but it could be any one of this myriad of other things that I mentioned today that it could be. So I'm not saying you're not dizzy, I'm just saying it's not vertigo, you know? You can, you can generate that yourself through your doctor in, in order for insurance to uh, cover physical therapy for anything, for knee pain, whatever, it's, a doctor has to write an order. And the doctor can write, you know, Jane Doe, vertigo, please treat, and sign their name. That's all it has to be. I know what I need to do. I don't need specific orders. Just tell me what the name is, the diagnosis, and that's all I need. Uh, so often generating it yourself. If you suspect vertigo, you just go to the doctor say, I got vertigo, I know it, I want to go to PT to somebody who can fix it. So it's, yep, yeah, very good question, yes. I appreciate it. There's always that little old lady that says, no, I'm fine, I just fall down. Yes, and that's when I start saying, and that's why the evaluation has to be, con so the first visit is a pretty comprehensive eval because I'm looking at other things. I'm taking your blood pressure. I'm looking at how your eyes focus, follow my pen up and down because I'm watching for that wiggling, but I'm also trying to rule out some other things. If it ends up being just you're walking a crooked line, but that's truly just bad balance, my treatment's going to be completely different. That's not going to be one, two things and me throwing you around and you're all set. That's going to take some strengthening of the core and giving you some balance exercises and things like that. So you're absolutely right. Right, because the patient will not give you the correct information because I'm not going to the to live with those little old ladies. Yep, yep, exactly. So my job is to get that information. Yeah. Does this happen? Does this happen? Do you have that? So I, I just poke and prod until I get the information I need. And the answer to that was wait till the event happens and then... And of course, you fractured the leg, and then was taken. Mm, the yeah. See, that's what we're trying to. If it's just straight out low balance, that's fine. That's fixable. Uh, balance really corrects itself very quickly if you do work. It really. It's not like strength. You know, like the strength of your stomach muscles. You girls that are like, oh, I can't get this tire to go away. Um, that takes a while. It's taken a long time to get a tire. It's going to take a long time to lose the tire and get those muscles strong. Balance is different. Balance is fixed very quickly if you just work at it. It's very simple. Good? Anything else, Marsha, for you? We didn't, I didn't know that we could go to Lydia Taft or that we could ask our primary care physician to do a referral for this kind of assistance right in our own town. Mm -hmm. So, and if you need a ride to Lydia Taft for any of the, your um, therapies, please let us know because we offer transportation to Lydia Taft. Yep. So this is a problem that we could help you alleviate pretty quickly and we can even help with transportation. Yeah, our secretary, if we know you're coming from the senior center, our secretary will immediately say, okay, let me call Marsha down at the center and we'll arrange your rides and one of us will call you back with when your appointments are because they'll, they'll work directly together to make that happen for you. That's right. So Donna works very hard as our transportation coordinator. If you get a series of appointments for six weeks, just call us. We'll work very closely with Brenda's office, and we'll make sure that those appointments uh, are set up for you in a way that we can guarantee you a ride. Yep. Yep. So we'll move our appointment time around to get that ride to happen for you. So that's not a problem. So I think it's a very good uh, partnership. So mm -hmm. keep that in mind. And stay well balanced. Yes. Practice your core exercises. I know I'm going to do that. It's something that we can do every day right at our seats or while we're brushing our teeth. Yep. So thank you for all those great, helpful no tips. Problem. Thanks no problem. for coming out. All right. Thank Take you, care. Brenda. Thank you.